You're watching CBS 5. Now, Eyewitness News. Good morning. I'm Sherry Hu. I'm Bill Schechner. It is a minute before 8 on Sunday morning, the 22nd of May, a sunny Sunday as well. Stem cell research took a major step forward this week when, as you know, South Korean scientists said they can clone embryos and produce stem cells that will not be rejected by a patient's body. So the question now, how does that shape the medical and ethical debate here? Richard Hayes, executive director of the Center for Genetics and Society in Oakland, is here to share his thoughts with us this morning. And good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much. Let us start first with, with the announcement in South Korea. Does this mean we are yet another step closer now to actually cloning human beings? Um, the short answer is it certainly does. Now, of mm -hmm. course, you have to understand what you mean by that term cloning. It can mean different things. We're certainly closer to some potential medical, uh, medically beneficial applications, but it also does bring us closer to the day we could actually create a cloned, live-born human being, which most people say really we should not be doing. Right, and that's the ethical debate. But, but I know the South Koreans have mentioned, too, that they can take the embryos they have, but these are embryos that cannot be brought to term. Do you, are, are, are we merely speaking of the will to do it, or, or research technically it can't be done? Well, let's put it this way. The uh, very embryos, the first stage of developing the blastocysts, the embryos that, from which the stem cells with potential medical applications would then be extracted, that very first stage is exactly the same stage that you want to go through if you want to create a live-born human clone. So again, the challenge before humanity right now, and it's both a ethical, moral, political, social challenge, the challenge is to summon up the will, the knowledge, the wisdom to know exactly where to draw the lines so that we can allow benign, beneficent medical research to proceed, but not cross over that threshold to a new world of human clones and designer babies and human animal chimeras. That's the challenge before all of us right now. Well, that <coughs> implies that scientists and also people who have a commercial interest in this have the willpower and the self-restraint to do that. Is there any evidence that they in the past ever had and in this case will? Well, you are asking, I think, one of the world historical questions before us right now. I was talking to a scientist, this was not very long ago, and put that exact same question. Will the, can the scientists restrain themselves from crossing over some of the boundaries that the mass of humanity has long said we don't want to go down? And at first, he had a blank look on his face as he had never heard the expression, and then he burst out into a guffaw. How could you imagine scientists ever wanting to restrain themselves like that? Now, again, that's just coming as a pure scientist. Now, many scientists, most scientists, are also committed human beings. They don't want to do things that are contrary to what's good for humanity. But there are all the pressures, and you mentioned yourself, Bill, the biotechnology industry and the commercial motivations and the like. So what has to be done? This is, with all major issues, as before, nuclear power, nuclear weapons. A mobilized citizenry needs to become involved. People in all situations, from all backgrounds, need to educate themselves, become politically active, and say, listen, we want to support medical research, but we don't want to go down some of these socially pernicious directions. Then what do you think will happen with California and the money being put into stem cell research now? In what direction do these researchers go, and do they follow the lead of South Korea? Yes, very, very important question. And I should be very you know, honest here. Um, our organization, the Center for Genetics and Society, we support stem cell research, we support public funding for it, but we want to make sure it goes forward in a way that is carefully monitored, has strong public oversight and control. And the problem with Proposition 71, it did provide money, which needs mm -hmm. to be forthcoming for stem cell research, but it was lacking many of those normal social oversights and controls that most state agencies have and that uh, agencies of the federal government or other countries have as a matter of course. So we have to do several things. One, we have to make sure the research proceeds, but we have to get the sorts of legislation, the reforms in place to make sure it's done the right way. And actually, Senator Deborah Ortiz, who is a big supporter of Prop 71, is now sponsoring legislation that would put some of the controls in that, uh, to, uh, uh, to address some of the flaws in the proposition. They should be supported. We are, uh, I got to say, this is not a reassuring conversation we are having at this moment. <laughs> I think that humanity, <laughs> all people need to undergo a crash course yeah. in the nature of these technologies and implications and begin informing themselves and become politically active to make sure we draw the lines in just the right way. Well, we're going to continue it. It is the talk here in California, speaking of California politics and Washington, D.C. as well, and also San Francisco, stem cell research making big news.
We were talking about this earlier on CBS 5. Joining us again now to discuss this medical issue is Richard Hayes of the Center for Genetics and Society in Oakland. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for getting up early to, to be with us. Thank you. We in California are going to invest several billion dollars in this, and the question arises, since we are independent of all other controls, are we free to do whatever we wish? Could we do what the Koreans are doing and go against what the president is recommending, which is to sort of hold back on creating new lines of stem cells? Well, the proposition that was approved in November does, as you say, it allocates $3 billion of taxpayer monies for stem cells research and actually gives very broad latitude to what can be allowed. Now, this has both, if you will, positive and questionable implications. So positive in the sense that it allows uh, potentially beneficial research to proceed. But boy, here's the thing we have to be aware of. These technologies, uh, human cloning, stem cell research, genetic ma manipulation, are among the most powerful that humanity has ever developed. And if we want to go down the road so that they're used in the best way, but also safely, we need strict controls rather than loose controls. And we don't have that, right? We have a board of directors which is sort of self-appointing in much. charge of this thing. Yes, the tragedy of Prop 71 is that it was written uh, by um, you know, individuals, certainly well motivated, but with uh, very strong personal interests in seeing this proceed almost a locomotive pace. And really a counter, it, it, it left out many of these sorts of checks and balances and controls that are the norm in other research endeavors uh, nationally in other countries. So it really is now up to, I think, the citizens of California to become educated and make sure that the right sorts of controls on the biotech enterprise are put into place. On the other hand, it's not that I'm advocating or trying to play devil's advocate and saying no controls, but if California, if the United States does not catch up in the same technology, for instance, that South Korea has developed in this, doesn't the U.S. stand to lose a lot, both in terms of medical research and also um, brain drain, perhaps, uh, economics, money. Yes, no, and, and it, I think it's, it's very important that, let's say, all the nations of the world agree on the right sort of standards so that we can go mm. forward in the best possible way. Again, if you're, you're looking at technologies that have the potential mm -hmm. to change medical science in fundamental ways, also, however, to change human society in fundamental ways could be dangerous in terms of a new eugenics and dividing civil society really at the root and core. We don't want to go down that direction. So rather, what's needed to prevent, if you will, and you're familiar from the environmental movement, a race to the bottom where countries are competing to have the weakest environmental regulations, we need national agreements and international agreements that say here's the controls we want to put in place, here's the medical research we want to support, but here's the eugenic technologies that we want to draw the line against. And that's the danger right now, that these technologies are moving so fast that civil society, political leaders, the general public hasn't had the time to understand what's going on, what's at stake, and yet it's moving pell-mell. So this is the reason why the, I think the predominant ethical framing does need to be one of caution rather than over-the-top enthusiasm. I want to step back from this just a little and, and briefly and ask, ask you a big question ask you an answer briefly. Um, do you think we're seeing a clash between religion and science as we approach this issue? Well, that's certainly the way a lot of it is being portrayed right now. And wouldn't that be a tragedy if a set of technologies that have the potential for great medical benefit but also have real dangers become polarized in the same way that, say, the abortion wars have over the past several decades? I want to be very upfront myself, our organization. We are pro-choice on abortion. We support a woman's right to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. And at the same time, we are very concerned about the socially pernicious applications of these technologies. And if you look at polls, public opinion polls, there's a broad middle of the American people that are uncomfortable with both the extremes, if you will, the religious right that wants to shut everything down, but also the biotechnology industry and much of the research community that really wants, that resists even reasonable oversight and control and would really have no problem with an unfettered free market in human embryos. Well, there's a broad middle that wants to say, listen, we support medical research. We're not opposed to human embryo research in principle, but we certainly don't want to turn this over to the free market and venture capitalists to exploit. I, I think the key then, unfortunately, we have to wrap up right now, but how we're ever going to come to agree on what these controls will be then, considering that Americans don't agree on much else. Well, it'll come so. just as way we came around nuclear weapons or environment. We have to have meetings, educate, and work together. Thank you. Thank you so very much. much for joining us this morning. Richard Hayes, the Center for Genetics and Society in Oakland. I really wish we could continue this because we could go on. Yeah, you're a, uh, a smart mm -hmm. and uh, energetic resource, and you're coming back. Thank <laughs> you so much. Appreciate <laughs> there it. There you go. Look forward to it. He's promised Thank us. You. We're holding him to that.